Let's try tonight to, to build up to an understanding of uh, Diocletian and his so-called reforms, and why these were bad, and why you don't want to try them again. You don't want to go down that road another time. Uh, and, and where all of this stuff uh, came from. And I suppose where we ought to start is the, um, the cult of Apollo at Delphi as the, the um, you could call it an, an organ of world government. As a matter of fact, the more you look into it, the more it does appear as, as functioning in many ways uh, similar to the United Nations Security Council and the, and the General Assembly of our own time. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, and some of these personalities also seem to come back. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get after uh, Boutros Boutros a little bit later on. Uh, the, the Delphic Apollo, there were... Uh, probably half a dozen different oracles that the Greek world knew. But this was the dominant one. Uh, and it had this funny position of being in the center of the Greek world in terms of geographical location. Actually, if, if there's, a, if there's a, a map, is there a map around here? Is there? Would it be possible to, like, to get a map of the Mediterranean world or something like that? Thank you. Uh, the legend is that Zeus wanted to find Sure, sure. The legend is that Zeus wanted to find the center of the world, so he released an eagle from each extremity of the universe. And these flew on a line and met, and that was Delphi. So it's this rocky, craggy place where this strange temple is located. Now, the Apollo that is worshipped there is, of course, the oligarchical deity par excellence. And, and many things flow together into the, into the shape of Apollo. In, in many ways, Apollo is Marduk. Marduk being this uh, sinister oligarchical god of the interior of Asia Minor, of Turkey. But then, of course, there's also in Apollo this overtone of Isis and Osiris, and that Apollo with this Pythoness, right? This woman, the Pythia, we'll see who she is, uh, reminds you somewhat of Isis and Osiris, and uh, of course the fact that uh, Osiris was castrated, big important aspect in the whole thing, and then brought back from the dead by Isis. This, th the way that the, uh, the temple was set up was that you had this priestess, uh, the Pythia, the Pythoness who was, uh, whether she was young, as she was at certain points by, by tradition, or, or sometimes only older women were allowed to do this function, she would uh, start off by being a, a relatively illiterate country woman who knew really very little of what she was doing. But she would mount a seat, which was placed on a tripod, over a kind of cleft in the ground. It was some, something you obviously you wouldn't want to fall into. But she would s sit on this thing. And after having eaten certain kinds of ceremonial foods, burned barley corns and other kind of stuff, she would begin to babble. And she would just babble. And she would go into transports of Apollonian ecstasy, whatever, and just talk, right? Speaking in tongues, I guess, if you've, uh, if you've heard any of that stuff going on. Now, how did anybody make sense out of this? Well, there was a priesthood that was attached to the temple of Apollo. And these were the oligarchical families of Delphi, which was a small state. It was a, well, it was a city-state, I guess, to some extent. But small, not populous, not powerful, not anything special in itself. But somehow these people represented a cross-section of Greek oligarchical opinion, and more important, were connected to these Babylonian magi and the people who were operative in the Persian Empire to the east. So uh, the way it would work then is that you would come as a representative of Athens or of Corinth or whatever you were. You would bring gifts, put down money, and you were then allowed to question the Pythoness who would then go into one of these transports, and she'd rattle off a whole bunch of babbling, 
And then the priests would come up and they would explain what it was that she had said, which had, of course, to come out in Greek hexameters of a certain literary quality. Now, that, well, that makes these guys the original spin doctors. <laughs> They put the spin. There was, it, something happened, and they tell you what it was, right? What did all that mean? And in Greek hexameters. Now, uh, the prestige of this oracle was, was uh, immense. It was, a, uh, it was obviously a bank. There were these deposits of treasure, gifts that were made. The, the, the wealth of this place was, was a legend in antiquity. And uh, it was also, therefore, a, a treasury. It looks like various cities actually kept part of their funds there, as a kind of a central bank for the Greek uh, states. Obviously, with the priests, with cults. And then, of course, the fact that since everybody came there on these missions, the priests learned the knack of pumping everybody for information. So as, as many authors say, this was the biggest intelligence bureau uh, in the world. They would uh, sometimes formulate answers. For example, with one guy, he, he said, look, should I invade my neighboring country? And the answer was, if you carry out the invasion, you will destroy a great kingdom. Of course, it turned out that it was his own kingdom that was destroyed. This was King Croesus. But there are, uh, I think, important uh, tendencies in the, in the way that the uh, Delphic Oracle operated that uh, that are, that are worth pointing out. The main thing is that it was, it was an organ of the oligarchy and that this can be proven by the political choices that it made. I mean, it, it made these things repeatedly. First of all, the main favoritism of the Delphic Oracle was for Sparta. And why is this important? Well, as Schiller uh, pointed out in that famous lecture on, on history, the, uh, the principal tendencies that combat in Western civilization are the tendency of Lycurgus of Sparta, the oligarchical, imperialist, militaristic one, and Solon of Athens, the city builder on the other side. Well, it is uh, a legendary that Lycurgus's constitution of Sparta was either dictated, as I think is likely, dictated by the priests of Apollo at Delphi, or at least approved by them. In other words, Lycurgus brought it to the oracle and saying, don't you think that the Lacedaemonians ought to be governed by these laws? And then, of course, the Pythoness went, and the priest said, yes, you win, Lycurgus. So that is the version that we find in Xenophon, that uh, Lycurgus went to the oracle and got the uh, version, the constitution for Sparta approved. Thank you, Joey. We're just, we're just going through some stuff on the Delphic uh, oracle. Great, over there, yeah, over there would be fine. But not on, not on the, yeah, good. Thank you. Now, um, you can also see in cases of war, the Delphic Oracle would sometimes declare that it was supporting one side or the other. Uh, for example, in the case of the Peloponnesian War, a little bit before 400, right, this general war of, of the Greek states, uh, the Delphic Apollo made a, an unsolicited declaration that they were supporting, they were supporting Sparta. Not only were they supporting Sparta, but they were not going to wait to be asked. They were going to support them and go down the line with them no matter what they did, which is rather revealing, I guess you'd say. Now, the other, the other uh, way that the Delphic Apollo expressed its pro-oligarchical tendencies is its support for the Persian Empire. Because, of course, Greek history in this time is this endless war, century upon century, of trying to stand up against the constant encroachment of the Persian Empire, which they basically succeeded in holding off and ultimately uh, conquered, even though the Greeks by that time were weakened themselves. It is uh, the attack of uh, the Persian Emperor Xerxes, which uh, concerns us here. This is reported in Thucydides. The Athenians sent 
a delegation of two representatives to the Delphic Apollo, basically saying, well, Xerxes is, a, is attacking us. He's approaching. What should we do? And uh, this, is a, this is a remarkable opinion that was then tendered by the Delphic Apollo. The Delphic Apollo basically said, uh, you wretched men, what are you sitting here for? Fly to the ends of the earth and leave your homes in the topmost heights of your wheel-shaped city. The fierce, the fire and fierce Ares driving his Syrian car will destroy your city, and he will lo lay low many other fenced cities and not yours alone. So after some more verbiage like this, depart from my sanctuary with your souls steeped in sorrow. This was the advice that the Delphic Oracle gave Athens at the moment that Xerxes was on the march. Now, the two Athenians said, we can't go back with that. We, we can't, you know, that's defeatist. That, that's going to ruin everything, right? No, nobody's going to fight if they've heard that opinion from the Delphic Apollo. So what they did, they, they, they knew that there was a trick you could pull with the Delphic Apollo. You could get a second opinion. And the way you did that was you had to come then as a suppliant, not just as a client with gifts, but you had to come expressing uh, a, a great deal of uh, s subordination to this thing. And you had to pick up what they called supplicatory branches. In other words, you had to some, come, come in with these boughs of laurel or myrtle or whatever it was. And therefore, can't you give us a second opinion? Right? Can't we have a better response for the country? And the Pythia at this point says, well, don't quietly await the cavalry and infantry that in a mighty host are advancing from the mainland, but turn your back and withdraw. You shall live to fight another day. And uh, mentions a few things about uh, maybe ships or the ocean or something like this. Um, they then, this was, this was also how basically saying, run for your lives, although in a slightly less purple rhetoric. Uh, they went back, these two Athenians, to their uh, general Themistocles, and he was forced then to put his own spin on this, basically saying, well, indeed, why don't we try fighting in the water instead of on land? And this is then the Battle of Salamis, which the Greeks won against the Persians. But no thanks to the, <laughs> to the Delphic Oracle, right, which was basically saying, run for your lives. And then when the Greeks, the, the Athenians tried to give supplementary presents to the Delphic Oracle as a result of the victory, saying, well, you know, we, thanks to your prophecies, we did prevail. The Delphic Oracle, was apparently the only time this ever happened, said, no, we can't take those presents from you, Athenians. So uh, this obviously gave the, gave the Delphic Oracle a, a bad name. Now, the other thing that the Delphic Oracle uh, did was its support of Rome. And I think this, this is the, um, the thing that I wanted to look at just a little bit uh, also this evening. The Delphic Oracle is basically anti-Etruscan. Remember that in the Italian peninsula at the time, when you had Rome starting off, the most advanced civilizations were these Etruscans in the north, Tuscany, right, Florence, whatever, Po, Plain, and then in the south, from Naples all the way south, those were all Greeks, right? That was the so-called Magna Graeca. And remember that Naples continued to speak Greek all through the Roman Empire until it went way into the Middle Ages. That was a Greek city and not, not Italian. Nevertheless, the Delphic Oracle supported Rome. And they did this with the same kind of public stress that you can see in the way that they supported Sparta, or supported the Persian Empire against, against Athens and the other Greek uh, cities. During the course of uh, early Roman history, you have to remember that the Romans were this backward, uh, uncouth, brutal, murderous bunch compared to most of their neighbors. They were inferior. But the uh, Delphic Apollo supported them. For example, whenever they got into these wars with the Etruscan cities, like you, you read this in... Um, Titus Livius, right, Livy, the history of the Roman Republic, that whenever there's a, 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 a battle, a war going on between, say, Veii, Veii is a, is a large and relatively rich Etruscan city just a little bit north of Rome, 
that the Delphic Apollo was giving advice what to do, how the Romans could, could overturn Veii, and they did. Uh, at a later point, the Delphic Apollo decided that they would give an unprecedented permanent endorsement of Rome. And they did this by singling out a special black stone, which was called the Niger Lapis. Very interesting thing. Right? Niger Lapis. It just means black stone. That's all it means. The Black Stone Rangers, way back then. This was located in Greece, but it was the symbol of the Magna Mater. It was the great mother, uh, Cybele. This was supposedly the dwelling place of the goddess Cybele. So the Delphic Apollo put out an opinion that this black stone had to be moved, and it had to be taken from Greece and put in the Roman Forum. And that's where it stayed. And they, there still is in the Roman form today. If you go there, there's a black stone that they claim is the, is the one. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, during the, during the t so this was, a, this was a, a permanent endorsement. Words, this, this is something that was never really done for anybody in quite that form. Now, later on, uh, in the Punic Wars, when Rome was fighting with, uh, with Carthage, right, the great thing that decided who was going to dominate the the central Mediterranean. During the days when Hannibal crossed his uh, elephants over the Alps and was laying waste to all parts of Italy, the Delphic Apollo sent messages of encouragement to the Senate and the people of Rome, saying, hang on, keep fighting, don't give in, you can defeat Hannibal, and uh, ultimately did. This is pretty much what what happened. But again, with the help of the intelligence and the propaganda and the cults coming out of the Delphic Apollo. The other thing that we have to just recall is that in these days, after the death of Alexander the Great, there were kingdoms that grew up as the result of the falling apart of Alexander's empire. Right? These are the so-called, I guess they're sometimes called the Epigones, the Epigoni, Epigonoi. They're sometimes also called the diadochi, the, the generals. That, and if you were a big general under Alexander the Great, you had a pretty good chance of becoming king and founding a dynasty. And the cases of that that are most interesting are the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. These were Greeks, basically, who set up a, a uh, kingdom here in Egypt. And then the so-called Seleucids. The Seleucids was, was another general and his gang who took over Syria. OK. Um, the Delphic Apollo liked the Ptolemaic uh, dynasty, supported them, uh, which is interesting. We'll get it later on when you get to, to Cleopatra, because that's, of course, what, what she was. Now, when the uh, Roman Empire came along, it's interesting to see which of the Roman emperors or proto-emperors were most supportive of the Delphic Apollo. Uh, Mark Antony, during the time that he dominated the eastern part of the Roman Empire, uh, came forward as a protector of the Delphic Apollo, saying, I'm going to rebuild this place. It was burned down, of course, a number of times. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix it up again. The other emperors who um, were most in favor of the Delphic Apollo were uh, Nero, who uh, went there and uh, actually he he did some kind of an Indian giving operation. He gave them 100,000 sesterces, but then took away all their land, something like this. Domitian, uh, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian. And it's interesting that the, there's, a, there's a definite pattern that the emperors that were most friendly to the Delphic Apollo were also the most ferocious in, in persecuting the, the early Christians. Now, later, this guy Plutarch, right? We don't want to forget him. When the Delphic Apollo had been uh, more or less incorporated into the Roman system of things. Plutarch, the guy who writes these, these famous parallel lives, right, the lives of the noble Greeks and Romans, was a member of the priesthood. Right? He, was, he was somebody who operated as part of the priesthood of the, of the Delphic Apollo. The last attempt to revive this thing in its old glory was the emperor Julian the Apostate. 
remember him. Remember, because Constantine became a Christian, so-called, and made the, you know, the, the official uh, uh, religion of the, the Roman Empire became Arian Christianity with, uh, with Constantine. But Julian the Apostate said, no, this is no good. Let's get back to the good old pagan ways. And he tried to build this significantly around the, uh, the uh, t Temple of Apollo at, uh, at Delphi. Now, the point of this is that this is the essence of what is metastasizing this, this thing. And again, it, it appears as a Greek institution, but what it really represents is this whore of Babylon faction. It is the Babylonian magi, the people that uh, pop up, for example, around the Roman court. Right? The, the most famous example, I think you may remember, is the emperor Tiberius, right? the one who presided over the crucifixion, had a Babylonian advisor by the name of Thrasyllus. Right? And every, do people know the famous story about, about how Tiberius met Thrasyllus? Well, they're on this cliff of, of Capri, right? the island of uh, Capri, near Naples. And what, what Tiberius would do is he would, he would test these different uh, soothsayers. And if he didn't like them, he'd have them thrown off the cliff. So here was Tiberius with, with a bunch of uh, centurions and guards. And um, he went up to Thrasyllus and he said, let's, let's see if this guy knows what's going on. So he asked him a couple of questions. He said, well, what do you see in my future? And Thrasyllus looked into his crystal ball or his bird entrails or whatever it is he had. And he said, wait a minute. I, my picture is completely blurred by the fact that my life is in extreme danger. <laughs> and Tiberius said, this guy knows what's going on. Let's get him. So that's... That's the type of the, of the Babylonian magus. And these, these are the people that were present in the uh, Roman Empire. Now, 